thing is. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this evening's Jumpinar. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes. For those of you just joining, we'll be starting in just a minute or two as soon as we get some more folks uh, logged in. All right, so it looks like we've got uh, just about 30 folks here with us this evening. So we'll go ahead and get started. So most of you who come here and join us each Monday probably are used to seeing Derek. He is taking a well-deserved vacation this evening. So we will be, um, we will be having me host and, and Maeve Daly from our office is going to be doing the back end um, of everything this evening to kind of help us out. So I thank Maeve for being here and also uh, thank our speaker this evening and guest, Andy Davenport. And I'll introduce him in just a moment. But before I do, uh, as I do every week, I just wanted to give you an update on our loan program. So if you are interested in learning more about our loan program, I urge you to go to jumpstartphilly.com. You can find out where we lend, our terms and conditions, even put in your application online. Um, so if you are looking to do your first or your next project, check us out there and we would be more than happy to answer any questions you have. So, um, and as a reminder, we will be doing a Q and A at the end of this evening's discussion and you can uh, submit your questions via the Q and A icon. It's typically at the bottom of your screen, could be somewhere else depending on, on where you're, um, what type of device you are using. So let's meet tonight's guest. So in addition to being a Jumpstart Germantown mentor, Andy Davenport is Vice President of Affordable Development for the Michaels Development Company. Andy is involved in all aspects of housing development, including securing financing, community outreach, and working with housing authorities, finance agencies, community partners, and other stakeholders to bring complex affordable housing developments from concept to reality across the Northeast region. He's currently involved with projects in Philadelphia, Newark, and Connecticut. So welcome, Andy. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. Thank you for uh, having me. So happy to be here. Excellent. We're really excited. Um, so I wanted to start 
by asking you about something that you said the first time we met, which was just a few weeks ago, we had our, our mentor appreciation dinner. And you said, I'm not a developer, I work for a developer, which is actually how I usually start anytime I talk. I, I make that clear to folks. I'm not a developer, I, I work for one. So I wanted to ask you, um, you know, why, why you aren't a developer yourself and work for one and what the company that you work for does, what type of development. <clears throat> so I, a, a developer in my mind is uh, someone who has something at risk in doing real estate projects. And when I say I work for one, the Michaels uh, Development Company is part of the Michaels organization, which is the largest developer and owner of affordable housing in the country. And we are based right across the river in Camden, New Jersey. And we have a large Pennsylvania and Philadelphia presence. We have about 2,500 units in the city, all of which are affordable. And they were, have been constructed between 1973 and as recently as 2016, we did our last, it's actually an acquisition rehab of about 500 units. So when I say I work for a developer, I do all the work. I do all the uh, entitlements, get the projects approved, get them financed, work with the city, state, and local agencies to, to go through from closing, construction, completion, lease up, and close out. Um, but I don't put up any of the capital at risk. I work for a salary and a bonus. And if things work well, I do a little bit better. If things don't work out, I don't lose anything. Um, and that's the difference between someone who works for a developer and a developer themselves, because they're the ones who have, have stuff at risk. And um, it's so great to talk to all the developers who are actually putting some, some skin in the game out there, especially skin in the game in, in Philadelphia, which is where I live and have lived since 2002. Yeah, yeah. So most of our folks are what we would call small scale. So, you know, the company you work for is doing big projects, um, but I think there's going to be a lot of transferable skills and, and you know, everything that, that you do at a larger scale, uh, a lot of it at least could probably be, you know, something that, that works at a smaller scale as well for, for the, the jumpstart folks. Absolutely. All real estate transactions look and feel similar to the same one you did if you bought a house. Right. You have equity, your down payment, you have debt, you have a closing statement, all those things. I have all of those things. They're just on a bigger scale. Yeah. And so, and how long have you been doing this kind of work? Uh, I started in affordable housing in about 2003 as an intern with the Office of Housing um, here in Philadelphia and have been at it ever since. All right. Um, working for developers since uh, 2007. So about 14, 15 years now. Great. And so as far as affordable housing goes, um, I know typically people think of it as large scale, but in your mind, just a quick take on affordable housing for smaller scale developers that are, you know, doing renovations, um, you know, how, how could they, how could they get into the affordable housing game or even, you know, make their own projects affordable? So one of the interesting things you're seeing, and, and, and the second you talk about affordable housing, in my mind, what triggers that from other aspects of development is the inclusion of an income cap. Mm -hmm. And at the most uh, kind of aggressive is your tax credit, your low income housing tax credit work, where you're really gonna be restricting to lower incomes from 20% 20, 20 of the area median income to a max of 60 or 80% of the area median income for a project. But that's not all there is. The city and other um, localities do affordable, uh, uh, production that isn't that strict. It can be 80% to up to 100% of AMI. And I think we're seeing more of that smaller scale stuff in the city, especially um, on some of the non-tax credit uh, land bank stuff we're seeing from the city where they are, the Philadelphia Land Bank is putting a handful of properties up at a time for uh, development where you'll get it for uh, nominal consideration but you'll have some restrictions. They won't be as, as intense as the low-income housing tax credit restrictions. So you can do a mix of market and um, some restricted housing for lower income folks, um, but it really depends. And I think the other place you're seeing it, especially for small scale developers is those who, and owners, are those who will rent to section eight, will take vouchers. And that is probably one of the most uh, direct ways in which a landlord or owner can 
provide affordable housing just by saying, yes, I will rent to folks who have a voucher and go through that process because it's a different process than just renting to someone who isn't off the street and doesn't have a voucher, doesn't have those restrictions. Definitely. And as to your first point, um, you know, most of the folks listening know this and, and as to you, but Jumpstart partnered with PHA uh, just recently and we were able to, to get 10 properties that are PHA owned in the hands of Jumpstarters who, and they will then go on to sell them at a cap um, to, to PHA clients, which is, is a great you know, win-win for, for our jump starters and also affordable housing for folks who, who need it. So um, it's Absolutely. Not, not large scale, meaning like there's not a ton of, of properties we had in that we're starting with, but, uh, but there'll be, you know, hopefully more in the future. So, um, and then another thing just real quickly before we get into tonight's topic um, that we see in our program is what an, a term I've only heard in the last couple of years, NOAA, the naturally occurring affordable housing, where it's not subsidized, but you know, it's it's when you're renovating a home on on your block or in your neighborhood, um, and you're not making it the best house on the block, and you're able to keep those rents low uh, or sell it, you know, at sort of it's it's market rate, but it's not uh, it's not like the extreme high prices. It's not moving moving the needle um, in an upward direction. It's kind of keeping things stable. Um, so I think a lot of our our projects probably fall into that type of affordable housing where they're not necessarily getting. A subsidy, but it's still um, "quote unquote" affordable. Absolutely, and I, and I think you see that a lot in a lot of neighborhoods in Philadelphia, um, some of the older traditional neighborhoods in in North Philly, mm -hmm. um, especially. Definitely. So, um, so tonight's topic, we're talking about how to best present your project to investors, lenders, and appraisers, and and often this this is talked about in terms of packaging. And so, to you, what does packaging a project mean? Uh, packaging a project, and this I do a lot of, is putting together all of the information that the bank, investor, even an appraisal, or all the, you know, at any given point, it, you're going to need to sell someone on your deal. And, um, and sometimes it's selling yourself. You, is part of that process is saying, what information do I have that I, makes this a good deal? You can go out and say, hey, I've been looking in this neighborhood. I think rents are here. This is, you know, I start putting together my budget, start putting together my pro forma. What does it look like? Now I've got to go out into the world. And now I've got to take the information I've put together, some of it from the gut, some talking to this person, that person, what I got on the web, and put it together in a way that people want to hear it and see it and then say, yes, I want to be part of this deal. I want to lend to this deal. I think this is going to, you know, they're saying they're going to buy it for this, but I think it's going to appraise for more and all those good things you want to kind of do when you're doing this. And you've got to create uh, a package, a story. And I create packages at multiple points. If I bring in a new deal to work, the first thing I have to do, if, if, if my company is going to start putting money into a deal that I'm working on, is I have to put an investment package together for our investment committee. We call it the deal package. And it's got a ton of information about uh, the neighborhood in which I'm working, who lives there, the market, what it's going to look like in five years, 10 years, 15 years, and sometimes 30 years. Um, and then I have to give them the data behind that. And so that's putting together the package. And every package is different based on the lender, investor, or funder, or, or just third-party person I'm talking to. It could be a third-party professional, a, a, an appraiser or market study folks, um, even some of the, the banks, when I do what's called a physical needs assessment on a rehab job, I give them, I need to collect data for them and package it to them so that they can give me the product back that I want and the investment I'm looking for. Great. So it sounds like there's different elements to the package. You mentioned budget, pro forma, a story, a narrative, putting to get together the data. Um, so what do you, you know, what are the typical elements that are in a package that you were, let's say it's to a lender, a potential lender. So what, for, would, what do you think those elements are? For a, for a lender, the first thing I do is I put together my development budget, my operating pro forma. And for a lender, they're going to want to see at least a 15 or 30 year uh, prospectus pro forma, how the property is going to do every year from rent income, debt service, debt service coverage, and then cash flow to, to me. And that's information I might have done, but when I'm packaging it, I clean it up. I make it look nice. 
you, the, 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 the package I have, you know, it's got a one page, beautiful summary. It says, these are the folks we're renting to because it's affordable housing, shows you what level of income they're doing, the square foots of the units. It's all packed up real nice in a way they can see in a one page thing. And then it gets into very detailed things. I get a detailed um, income page, the rental income page. I got a detailed operating expense. Shows a, uh, usually a monthly through the construction period. Then I have a detailed year pro forma for 15 to 30 years, showing the debt coverage for all that time. Um, and it's different. And, and if I'm doing a, something with a market component, maybe a, a 15 year with IRR calcs for investors at three, five, 10, 15, we do that as well. So that we can, we can judge the investment that, that they're gonna be looking at Great. Um, in advance. And then I often will, uh, especially for lenders or, or even before that, when I'm going to one, my investment committee, which is going to be more similar, I think, to, to the kind of things that, that, that jump starters will be, be doing, is putting together the package that isn't reliant on expensive third parties. When I take something to my investment committee, I'm not going to uh, have a market study in hand, an appraisal in hand, all the things when I go to a bank. I'll have in hand, I'll have, a, I'll have my environmental reports, I'll have everything done before I'm asking for money. But when I go to an, my investment committee, I'll have none of that. So I've got to put together rent projections, income projections. I, I have to have some market data. So how do I know I'm gonna make the rents that I'm, I'm projecting? My, my operating expenses, how am I justifying my operating expense? All that has to be worked out and I have to have some data behind it or else I'm not going to get investment from my company. They're not going to say, they're going to say, wait a second, go back to draw on. We don't think the market's there. We don't think uh, this is ready. And so that's a big part of what I do, especially on the front end, before I go into getting third expensive third parties, quite frankly. And so with that data, because um, you know, in, in our very small pro forma, we still are asking similar stuff. We're looking at, you know, your what do you expect to rent it for? What are your operating expenses? Um, and so where, where could folks find information on, you know, rents in the area where their project is, and then how can they determine what their operating ex expenses might be? So rents, uh, rents are almost an easy one, uh, because there's a ton of data out there. Um, but it, it, it's how you want to package it. Because you're going to have an idea, especially you, you've looked around, you've, you've, you've gone around the neighborhood, hopefully, and gotten some idea. Talk to a few landlords. Uh, when I do, when I include market rate um, property, a little bit of market rate units in my properties, which we often do um, as a component, I go and pretend to be looking to rent a property. I will go and call a landlord and say, hey, can I come see your apartment? I'm going to move to the neighborhood. I've done that a lot, and especially if there's new product in a market I'm looking at. I call them up, pretend to go in there, and I just because I want market data. I will go on to uh, Craigslist, see what people are renting apartments for. But the first thing I'm going to do is define what is my market area. And this is what market studies do. It my block range, is that my, and then is that my census tract, my census block, my zip code, and how does that compare to the city as a whole? So all of those points, I, I kind of define my area that I'm going to look at. And sometimes you've got to kind of match the area to the data that you're, you're kind of working through, especially when you get to that bank level. Let's say you've gone out there, you visited a bunch of comps, you got pictures of them. I would get pictures of them because you're going to need those when you package it for the banks. But then you go back and say, okay, how does that compare to what the bank will see? when they pull up their data, because they, um, they pay a lot of money and they have a lot of data. They, they have all the mortgages, all the rents that, um, all the mortgages they have, they're collecting rent data on. Um, or they pay CoStar or another data uh, aggregator. Um, Bricadia, which is a really big lender here, has an entire uh, research division. That's all they do. Um, they collect this, this market information for it. So, you've got to give them the best data that they can compare to what they've got there. So just having your Craigslist ads and reports should be uh, included with something that says, hey, these are the rents I found on Zillow in the zip code. 
these which match the incomes that I found on the Census Bureau, the American Fact Finder, um, which is constantly what you're doing. And then this is how it compares to the city. May or may not include that in the package. You know, if it's unfavorable, say, hey, listen, you know, my zip code is uh, is this, and 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 all the market information I've shown uh, confirms the rents I'm projecting, but it's lower than the city. I'm not going to put the city rents in my in 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 my uh, in my report in my package. You got to be judicious about it, but you want to know that information because it may come up. Definitely. It, it, so what what you're saying sounds like it would be really helpful for folks to do this. Um, even before that, like when they're for their own research, when they're looking at a property and analyzing, is this going to be a good project for me? So kind of put all this together. And then, like you said, when you package it, you make it a lot neater and, and concise and, and kind of pretty it up so that yes. it really um, pops when it, you know, and it tells that story. But it, it sounds like this is all really good information for any borrower, um, you know, potential developer to, to look at even before before sending it to an investment committee or, or, um, or a lender. Or an investor or a lender. No, I've, I've, had, I've had projects where uh, I'm certain I'm gonna be able to achieve X dollars in rent. And I've gone out, interviewed some folks, done it. And then I'm starting to put together my investment committee package. And I can't find the data that I thought was, that I thought was there. I found it anecdotally, but I can't find it um, in, in the, in anywhere else. Well, that's a, that was a big, that's a big red flag for me. It doesn't mean I'm going to run away. It's going to make me reconsider some of my assumptions uh, for sure. So if I can't get the data to support my initial assumptions, then yeah, I'm going to rethink that and come back to it. Um, or I may, you know, in that case, I may be for a larger deal, a bigger deal, I may pull out and say, okay, I need to get some third party on this. I mean, I may need to talk to someone else who has better data than I do. Or I'm, or I'm looking at this role because that that can be worthwhile as well. Right. Because I, I can justify, or if I can only justify it in a few sources, but it's it's a lot of back and forth. That's when I do go and say, okay, um, if I'm if I'm already working with a broker or a lender, I'll say, what other comps do you have, and have you seen anything in the appraisals or any other studies that have been done that can that I that can justify me here, mm -hmm. and and work with that. And use brokers and appraisers. They see a lot of that information come across their desk regardless. And you can get that information once you have those relationships established. That's Yeah, that's a great, um, that's definitely a great tidbit and tool for folks to use. It's a, you know, we talk a lot about building that team and, and having someone who's an appraiser or a broker on mm -hmm. that team can definitely be helpful for, and this is something we hadn't talked about, but, you know, in in doing your research for new projects and not just the one that you just finished. Um, so, yeah. and, and especially if you're working in a slightly different neighborhood and you've got a, a broker who's worked a lot in that neighborhood or a lender who's worked a lot in that neighborhood, there's, an, there, there's some good opportunity to get some information and get to see what they want to see, especially on the lender side. What are you seeing from other borrowers? Mm -hmm. How can I, you know, what data are they getting? What data don't you like? They may say, you know what? We think Zillow is terrible and we don't want it. Right. Fine. Uh, okay, I will. I will get it elsewhere. So, of those sort of um, easily accessible sites like the Zillow and the Trulia, the Redfin, the Craigslist, like what? What are your favorites? Just for going, what do you feel like has the most um, accurate information? I, 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 that that's that's a tough one because because it really depends on the market. I quite frankly think the most effective thing to do is you know, uh, and it depends on the market, but I like Craigslist okay. a lot on market rate on, on, if I'm looking at a market to include market rate units in an affordable development and I'm, and I've got some concern that I'm, you know, cause I, I work in a lot of neighborhoods where the market isn't extremely strong. We'll still put market rate units there. Well, I want to compare. I will sometimes just take the temperature of, of what are the current rents compared to, and I do a lot of income comparisons. I'm working in a, a, a neighborhood. I want to know what folks are making in that in that area. Um, also helps. It doesn't it doesn't determine who's going to rent my apartment, in a sense that it doesn't determine who's going to be attracted to. Um, 
but it does tell me who's who's renting in the neighborhood now. Um, and and the banks are going to look at that as well. And the market, you know, a market study, that's one of the first things to do is define your market area, find out what the what the incomes are. Um, and then visiting, I go and visit properties, take pictures, take a lot of pictures, use the pictures in your package. It's it's it, it's really worthwhile. Um, but in terms of specific web, websites, um, at a certain point, once I've gathered that information, sometimes I use whichever websites are, you know, I'm further enough, I'm for, far enough along that I'm pretty confident in, in my, my rental projections, my operating projections, then I'm going to use the information that reflects mine the best. Because at a certain point, I'm selling this now, when I'm taking it to the bank, when I'm taking it to the bank, I'm confident in, in the rents and projections, everything else. Now I just need the information that sells it the best to them. And so with that, like, so you, you have the numbers there, um, but you also talk that it's more than just numbers. So, you know, what is that other fact, those other factors and in, in, in that story that's beyond the numbers that help sell, sell a project? Well, it's the story. Um, especially when you're starting to do larger stuff, everything we do has a, has a one page, um, project description. And even if I'm not giving that as part of my package, I know that thing back to forth. I know the number of units, what, um, what the bedroom sizes are, what I'm anticipating for rents, what those renters will likely earn, especially on the affordable side. I have to, I have to tear out and who earns X number of dollars. Um, how much money they have to have to, to, to rent to meet, you know, kind of the minimum standards. And I know that inside and out, so it's my elevator pitch. And I've packaged that in bullet points. So if they do want it, I can hand it to them. And give that to the appraiser. Appraisers like that, that saves them time. They're more likely to say, hey, you're right. This, this, is, this is gonna do well because look at all this information you've already put into it. You already checked out the comps. You've already done that work. If I can get to the appraiser, then that's information I have for them. For the lenders, for all that. They may not want that one page uh, project description and sets of bullet points, but if you've got it, you know it, it'll, it'll make your presentation to them better. Um, and that's what all, a lot of this is about. It's not just, Hey, I know, I know this cause I know it. And you might be a thousand percent right. You might've been studying rents on that block for forever and that area. And you just, you've lived in the community, you know, what, uh, properties do, you know, who's, who's been, renting and how rents are ticking up, even though it doesn't quite show up yet on this block or in these blocks. Well, then getting the other information and packaging, packaging it in a way that people will be like, yeah, no, wait, that's right. Look at the, look at some of the data that supports that. Then you're, you'll, you'll have much more success with uh, lenders and investors. Um, and taking that data and that story and presenting it cleanly and succinctly I mean, as you can tell, I like to talk, I can go on. But when I'm talking to banks or investors, I try to be quick. They don't have a lot of time, they wanna to cut to the chase. So I try and give them the, the, thing, the key things they need quickly. And yeah, I gotta have it on hand. Yeah, that snapshot picture to, to kind of sell it. We, I mean, even in our very small scale uh, loan operation, we similarly, you know, we're getting in three to four applications a day. And it's, it's Derek and I that are looking at them. So we appreciate um, when everything is, is, it's very succinct and to the point, but, um, but does, you know, it's, it's filled out properly and, and has all the right information so that we're the, the potential borrower isn't wasting time having to go back and forth with us, with us, you know, having to ask lots of questions about, about their um, proposal, but yeah, oh, yeah. Definitely putting it, putting it together um, and, and, having that story, but having it be succinct, succinct makes, makes a lot of sense for sure. A, a one page summary that shows your income expenses, your, your NOI, if you need it, your IRR, um, and just a few points about how that came up with is invaluable. Then being able to recall the details that came into that work and being able to present that is the next is the next step because once they've gone through the one pager and they're like yeah i like that that's good that makes sense to me 
then you go into the net. Then, then the underwriters get their hands on it. And underwriters, their job is to dig. And so that's when you want to have the detail and say, okay, you came up to these rents, but what, what justifies these rents? Well, look, here, you'll see my five pages of comps. Here are the pictures. I mean, even for smaller scale stuff here, here are the, here are the Craigslist ads. Here I went and visited them. Here are the pictures. See how old and cruddy this is. I'm planning, this is my work schedule. Look how much nicer this is. So I do think I can achieve $10 more a month. That's, that means something. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. I think um, I, I want to go back a little bit. You, you talk about the, you know, having those comps available. So what if, you know, in a lot of our areas specifically, things are very block by block. And so someone will send in something and they'll have three great comps. But then when you look at, at all the comps, it's like, well, there's actually closer by ones that aren't as good. So how, you know, do you, do you, it's hard because people, of course, want to to show the best picture, but right. but also they need to be accurate. And so, you know, how how does how do you how do you kind of I guess follow that line of of making sure that it's it's going to have the the ARV that it needs when you're you know ready to refi um, when there's so many different comps in in a small area. It, it, they so, all seem good. <laughs> so. Right, and, and and that's and that is that is that is the big challenge. I mean, there's no, you know, um, there's no, the, there's never the perfect comp. You know, it's ne- you know, the the property that just got, you know, twenty thousand dollars worth of work is it was was converted into you know or fifty thousand dollars worth of work is three units looks great and is is leasing at a thousand bucks a unit. And it's just next door that the chances of that are slim to none. Right. So um, you, you can't ignore the bad info and you can't sweep it under the rug. You can say you got to have information about why it doesn't apply or if it applies, what that means for, for, for your project. If you're like, Hey, wait a second. You know, yeah. Two blocks over, They've got, um, they've got, you know, they've got that three unit thousand dollars a month um, building and there's three of them, but there's also zero vacancy. There's no vacant lots on the block. Um, Every house is being cleaned and, 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 and the bus stops right on that block and the bus stops two blocks from me. That's a consideration. Or you can say, hey, wait a second, I may not be able all the way there, but I'm not, the, the other comp you brought to me doesn't have this story. Look, there's no work on that block. It's got more vacancy than mine, you know, in terms of vacant lots. You may not be able to get the actual apartment vacancy. Um, and you've got to go and find out, like, hey, what's really going on? And, and listen, if, if someone comes back and says, I think this is a better comp for you, find out. That's good information. It's it's all information, um, you know. And 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 I've certainly been there with 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 banks, who who you know on a big bigger deal. I like wait a second. We don't. You know, your market study says X. Our market study says Y. I said okay. Well, let's look at your market study. What did what did it what does it have that mine doesn't? What is it taking into account that mine doesn't? And then sometimes I'm like wait a second. Your, 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 your primary market areas, you know, you've changed it up. And so if, if your lender gives you that information, that's just good news for you in a sense that it, it's, it's information you can use to either refine what you're doing or um, you can find out and say, Hey, wait a second. I think you might be wrong. I mean, you know, and you can ask that question like, Hey, wait a second. Why are you using that block? That block, that block is terrible. It's nothing like my block. My block's great. The, the block I'm working on, this is a good block. You know, this is, you know, these are, the, go, if you can get crime statistics and I can get it to the block, I can do that in some areas. I, I don't, I haven't tried that in Philadelphia, but if I can get crime statistics, and wait a second, the reason why this is crazy is because look at what's happened on that block. And yeah. I've, I've, I've done that with, um, on a larger scale with public housing development. I said, no, 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 you're comparing me to this one. That's, you know, this has, look at the crime statistics here and look at the crime statistics here. No wonder this one has higher vacancy rates. I wouldn't want to live there either. 
And so that becomes a thing that you go back and forth on. But um, it's worth talking. I mean, when those questions come up, those are conversations to be had. And say, wait a second, why are you doing this? You just say, well, here's why I chose this. Having some information about why you chose your comps is important. Yeah, I think that's that's really good advice. We have a lot of a lot of folks sometimes just um, give us what their realtor gave them, and they don't really, you know, they might not have even looked, and and, and they're like, well, this is what my realtor gave me, so it, it's got to be worth this. And it's like, well, let's look a little <laughs> closer. <laughs> so you really need to, you know, have your own eyes on this project and not just take the the word of of a realtor necessarily. And that's a good start, but realtors are also commissioned folks, and there's nothing wrong with that, but. And they have a lot of information. They can point you in the right direction, but you, 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 uh, um, you can't just take that at, at face value and say, oh, wait, no, well, of course that makes sense. Is right. it going to pass an appraisal? Right. And, and, and you always, be, yeah. How you mentioned that, you know, asking, asking the bank um, questions about where they got their comps from. And, and we encourage folks to do that with us because we'll often counter with, hey, this actually looks like it's, it might be a closer, more similar property. Um, and, and then you're right sometimes, because we aren't going out, we're looking at Street View. And it might be that Google Street View is a year old in the last year, that block has changed. And so if they're yes. like, actually check out the, you know, the, the permits on these three properties next door, they're all getting renovated. And then it's like, oh yeah, okay, well then that definitely changes things. Um, yeah. We're, you know, our data that we're looking from the office might be a little bit older. So, so yeah, yeah. definitely. Being on top of it and and you know not taking the, the bank's info or the realtor's info it, it just for that you know as the final word and, and doing more research sounds like it's important for folks to do. Yeah, I, I mean, and it's it's other things that that actually can impact um, and help. Photograph your if you're going to photograph your site, do it on a sunny day. Hmm. I, I, and, and it sounds silly, but it, it, it's true. Get, take nice photographs. You don't need to pay anyone to do it. Just take nice photographs. Take, take your time. Um, real estate on a sunny day, you know, a nice day, your pictures will come out better. Um, I, the same things, like I said before, you know, the, the same things go for buying and selling a house apply to most real estate transactions. You know, um, I always joke that I never look at new real estate on a sunny day because then I'm more likely to just be like, yeah, it'll work. It's great. You know, my deal junkie comes into effect. I'm like, yeah, let's do this. It'll, of course it's going to work. <laughs> 10,000 square feet, but we can get 40 units in there. No problem. It's fine. It's a beautiful day. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, so as we're wrapping up here, I just want to remind folks to put in any questions in that Q&A. Um, but yeah, so as, as you mentioned there, just that last tidbit of, of you know, taking, taking photos on a sunny day, what other just sort of tips for, for packaging that might not be specific to, um, you know, might not be a larger thing like the budget and, and the story and the data, but any other just tips for, for how to really present it and, and sell it to, to investors and, and lenders and appraisers? Um, a, a budget is a very simple thing. You know, and and it's very easy. Like I do Excel budgets all the time. I do back of the napkin Excel budgets, and it's it's a mess because I've been doing them for years and I know exactly how to do it and it looks like this and I'm done. I'm like, oh great, but I can't give it to anybody because it looks terrible. Take the time, make your pages look nice. Um, one of my mentees did he he did a a, a spreadsheet or a, a PowerPoint, and uh, I won't say who I really think it was for, and I don't think it was a bank, but it was beautiful. Um, really well done, succinct, the spreadsheet, the, the, you know, every column, the columns had a separate color, the total lines are budgeted in light gray, those things actually matter, banks actually care. It makes you look like a professional, and that's worthwhile. Um, and I know it sounds kind of silly because the information does, like my garbage budgets that I do on the back end napkin are just as good as I can, um, just as good as the pretty one. But I know it's going to happen if I try and hand that, hand that one to anybody. So don't think it's not worthwhile to take the extra time uh, using the Excel template and then mess with it just to make it look prettier. It's all worthwhile and, and, and it makes you look more professional, which makes people want to give you money. Yeah. Or more likely to want to give you money. 
Right. Yeah, that's great advice. Our um, we had a, a jump on our several weeks ago where we were kind of giving folks tips about our loan program. And similarly, just like making sure um, that it looks good. And we have a set pro forma, but just like putting in, you know, make sure you put the address of that property in like very simple things that you, when you're excited and you, you know, you know, you know, it's a great project that you might forget and, and just those little mistakes and just making sure that you sort of proofread and edit um, so that it's, it's easily readable uh, yep. notes on things. We'll have some people that just in one cell will write like, you know, paragraph after paragraph of notes. And it's like, that could be sent to us, you know, it, it's hard for us to read. It takes time to, to cut, cut and paste it into a document so that we can actually see what's going on. So all of those little things um, just save time. And, and, you know, it's not that we aren't lending to folks if, if, if it comes in messy, but it's, it's nice when, when it flows and we can go through it a lot faster and, um, and easier on our end. So. Right. Or, or when you're, um, when you get a little bit bigger and you start doing, uh, you know, maybe some new construction, maybe bigger 10 unit uh, rehab kind of acquisition buy hold situations, you need a bank. And they get a lot of money, a lot of people coming through, a lot of lenders coming through. Give them something that they're not going to throw at the bottom of the pot because time is money. And you want to be the first one, you know, when, when it goes to underwriting, you want to be the first one getting read and, 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 and being looked at and yeah. give them, you know, something succinct, succinct and pretty. It helps you get to the top of the pile. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much. I think that that wraps it up for, for this part of our discussion. And I'm going to see if we have some questions. It looks like we have one. I encourage anyone else um, that has questions to, to put those in. So Sonia is asking a question that I think is going to be a little difficult to, to answer because it's, um, it's pretty, I think it's going to depend on the bank. She's asking, what is the average bank loan in number of units? what size projects are banks interested in? Maybe that second one. Um, is there something, is there a type of project right now that you're seeing lenders are, are more eager and excited about lending? I, in, 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 in my world, um, there's, there, there are, you know, on the affordable side, it's, it's very different from this. The ones they want now are, um, we're seeing a lot of what we call agency loans, GSE, uh, Freddie Fannie loans um, with with large folks, but um, I think more important is find lenders who will take your loans, and that may not be a bank. Um, you know, there are a bunch of smaller financial institutions. Most lenders, most people you'll talk to, or not maybe maybe not most, but a lot of the people who will lend money to projects aren't banks; they're lenders. They will package your deal with other deals and. Um, banks then buy it for it. their brokers and the other like. So um, just reach out and find what you want. If you know, there are other things you can do, FHA has rehab things, but you typically have to live in those. But I think FHA has some pro uh, product where you can live and rent. So if it's a multi-unit with rehab stuff, so that's worth looking into. Um, FHA can be very challenging on commercial loans, however, just mm -hmm. to you haven't uh, done that before. Yeah, and uh, Sonia, as far as, you know, for our program, our average loan is about 115,000, um, which is pretty small, I would say, compared to most commercial loans. We don't have a minimum amount, um, but that our, our average is around 115. Yeah. And then um, that is actually the only question I think you, I think you're, you're you really covered everything really well. And I, I learned a lot. I'm excited about um, putting some of this into place as far as how you know we look at things and how we can um, communicate with our, our applicants and, and give them some tips on, on where they can go for different things as well um, on an everyday basis. So I'll definitely be using this information um, every day when I'm, when I'm communicating with applicants. So I really appreciate it. Uh, this was an excellent, conversation. And I, I thank you for not only being a mentor, but for sharing your time with us this evening, Andy. Great My time. pleasure. Um, if anyone wants to reach out, uh, you can reach through uh, Angie and probably get to me and happy to help in any way I can. Uh, good luck to everyone out there. Great. Um, and I'm just going to share uh, what's coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, let me bring that up real quick. All right. 
president. So next, uh, next week we have Understanding the City's OPA um, with Robert Luciani. And then on the 31st, Don't Get Stuck in Eclipse with Kelsey Lee. Uh, she's coming back. She did uh, one of our early on Jumpinars, and this is going to be a little bit more uh, in the weeds. So that first one was kind of an overarching uh, eclipse presentation. This one's going to go a little deeper. And then we do not have anything on the 6th because of the holiday. And then just as we always want to let you know, these are available as podcasts wherever you get your favorite podcast player. Um, just search for Jumpstart Philly Radio. And we have over 60 episodes. So if you have any uh, road trips planned, you can, can download those and, and listen on, on the way. And we will have this video available Wednesday and all of our past videos are also available at jumpstartgermantown.com back, backslash jumpinars. And I thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, this was a great conversation and we look forward to seeing you next Monday. All right. Thank you all so much. Bye. Bye.